Today's webinar is now live. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the telephone, just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Whilst all attendees are in listen-only mode, you will have the opportunity to submit questions by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be distributed in the post-event email along with a survey. I would now like to hand you over to your moderator, Steve King. Go ahead, Steve. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Thank you, Clara. Uh, my name is Steve King and I'm a technical director in the environmental consultancy part of our business at Black and Beach. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all to this afternoon's webinar, Digital Ecology Enabling Sustainable Net Gain Infrastructure Development. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to our speakers, Mr. Stephen Hines, who is project manager with LMJV, that's Lang O'Rourke Murphy Joint Venture, working on uh, the Enabling Works Phase 1, HS2. Uh, Mr. Simon Ross, uh, head of geospatial solutions at Resitec, and Mr. Matt Clegg, who is environment director of our consultancy services business here at Black & Beach. Lots of exciting stuff to talk about today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand straight over to Matt, who will take us through the presentation. Over to you, Matt. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the webinar. So defining digital ecology and digital ecology. So today we're going to look at what we mean by digital ecology and what the drivers are for its use what the current state of the art is, and what it could enable in the future to help, uh, meet, help us meet the critical challenges that we face in the UK and globally with climate change and, and other pressures. We're gonna be looking through the lens of one of the UK's major critical infrastructure projects, and we're gonna take a landscape scale view of how developing technology can play a role in helping us to build back greener. Lastly, we'll explore how integration of different forms of different digital ecology could provide a framework to enable a potential future for net gain. So let's uh, start off with a definition or some definitions. What, if you look to define digital and the, the words digital and ecology separately, you'll see there's little relationship between the two. And if you type in digital ecosystems into Google, as I did, you'll find lots about technology and software, but very little about biodiversity. So for our purposes, let's define it as the use and management of digital technology and data to understand how ecosystems function and enable effective, sustainable and evidence-based decision-making. So what are the drivers for digital ecology and my, 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 what, why might we need it? Well, we're on the verge, or some may say precipice, of a key moment in human history. Our world is faced with catastrophic biodiversity decline as a result of human impacts. And one of the greatest impacts, climate change, requires us to completely restructure the way that our critical infrastructure supports our societies, our economies, and our quality of life. But the dilemma and the challenge is that the footprint of this new infrastructure is only likely to lead to further biodiversity loss unless we change our approach and understanding and investment in the natural world. So before we move further, and with that statement, I'd like to get your view on what you see are the greatest challenges or blockers in addressing this dilemma. So if you could take a look at the poll on the screen and select one or more of any of the following, it will be interesting to see what your thoughts are on this. We're going to collect the results at the end and show uh, what people think about it. So if we give it a couple of, couple of seconds, and if you can choose, and then we'll move on to the next slide.
Okay, hopefully that's enough time. So let's move on and take a look at how we in the UK are looking to change the, that approach and address that challenge. So the principal drivers of the change are set out in the government's long-term 25-year environment plan and forthcoming environment bill. And the principal elements are net gain, focusing on biodiversity, for now at least, nature recovery strategies, and as yet to be determined long-term binding targets, which incorporate biodiversity as well as other ecosystem services and environmental factors. But for me, one of the fundamental aspects is the adoption of a natural capital approach that recognises the value of nature and biodiversity as an asset that benefits us all, not an inexhaustible extractive resource. And if we delve deeper into the appendices of the 25-year environment plan, you'll see that the government intends effectively to move further away from just an environmental regulation and compliance approach but to an approach which is based around natural asset management. Now we've touched on some of the drivers, some of the issues that are impacting upon those natural assets, but this framework also covers how our natural assets relate to each other and the benefits that they provide to human society and economies. And it defines how actions at the government level and tiers below will seek to plan and implement actions to arrest environmental decline. But ultimately the lifeblood of this approach requires accessible, reliable and up-to-date data and information about how ecosystems function and how the health and effectiveness of our natural assets changes over time in this new future. And in the words of the Secretary of State, if we had better live data, could we design plans for sustainable new projects and developments in a much more effective and efficient way? So how do we make the most value of the data that we have to underpin a natural asset management approach? To describe everything, we can never have enough, but we are arguably within the age of big data. But despite this, we see numerous examples where mishandling of data, the use of inappropriate tools, and miscommunication of transfer of data hamper even most sophisticated organizations, even NASA and simple units, um, and the coronavirus uh, Excel fiasco a few weeks ago. So these are the, some, of the, some of the questions that we need to consider and answer and to ensure that the data we use helps and enables decision makers to meet the challenges that we face. The sheer pace of technological development means we have a myriad of different ways of collecting data about the natural world, from the old school human sensing from ecologists in the field using binoculars and cameras and perhaps more latterly tablets, to the use of acoustic sensing devices, camera traps and video technology, the increasing use of remote sensing from satellites, drones and aircraft and advancements in camera technology, radar, laser sensing, etc. And perhaps the newest development is the recording and sensing of biodiversity data from a wide pool of amateur ecology enthusiasts through apps on their smartphones. All of this provides a sense of opportunity if we can make the right link and use the data generated by these different techniques in the right way. So that is the challenge. And to give you some context to how these challenges are being addressed, I'd like to invite our first speaker to take us through his experiences in managing the ecology data requirements of one of the largest UK infrastructures currently in the throes of early construction. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Matt. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Stephen Hines. I'm a project manager for LM. JV. Um, I'm going to give some examples of how we're using digital ecology on the HS2 um, enabling works project. A um, few things I want to touch on that Matt just um, mentioned around making sure we've got the right data and the right tools for collecting that data. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've done well, where things have fallen down, and um, a few insights on how we've delivered the works on HS2. So Firstly, just in terms of an introduction to HS2, I suspect if most of the people attending this webinar are from the UK, you've probably heard of HS2 before, but just in case um, you haven't, it's a it's a new high-speed railway for the United Kingdom. It's going to be built in two phases. So phase one consisting of the route from London to the West Midlands and Birmingham, and then uh, the Y-shaped network branching off towards Manchester and Leeds in phase two. 
Um, in terms of phase one, this, sec this section of the route is, is now under construction between London and the West Midlands. So that's 140 kilometres of new high-speed railway. Uh, there's going to be four stations along this section and about 32 miles of tunnels. So it's a big, big infrastructure project for the UK. It's also Britain's biggest environmental project. So, I mean, I've just picked out a few stats there. So 7 million trees and shrubs are going to be planted along phase one. 33 square kilometres of new woodland and wildlife habitat. So basically, this is basically a brand new railway. There's no existing rail corridor here. So this is new build railway. Um, as you can probably imagine, there's a lot of environmental um, impacts that we need to make sure we're managing very closely. And for those people who are very close to the project, we often describe it as, a, as an environmental project that happens to have a railway running through it because that's what it feels like sometimes. Um, I'm going to focus today on my slides on um, the work that we've been doing as, as LM Joint Venture working in what we call as area north on the enabling works. So phase one's been split into three sections, north, central and south. Um, and I've been responsible for the ecology surveys in the northern section of HS2. Um, just in terms of the enabling works, I just want to just, just take a moment just to explain what that means. So um, for, for many of you who imagine HS2, you're probably imagining um, high-speed trains running along embankments through tunnels over viaducts that sort of thing but before you can get to that there's a there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done clearing the route and, and making way for the new high-speed railway so i've just listed a few of the examples here of what we do as lm working on the enabling work so over the past four or five years we've been working on um, archaeological investigation works so making sure that the new high-speed railway isn't going to bury any um, important archaeological features that we want to we want to be able to use the opportunity of ages 2 to learn a lot more about the Black Britain's history. We've also had to do some clearing of the route. Obviously, if you need to build a new railway, you need to make sure you've got a, a route for it to go down. And as LM, we've also been doing some early construction works as well. So that just gives you a bit, a bit of a flavour for what we've been doing on the Enabling Works programme. Um, I mentioned it's Britain's biggest environmental project. Well, just a bit of a flavour for that. So from the ecology survey side of things, in the past four years, we've we've undertaken over 25,000 surveys, which is a staggering number of surveys, considering that each you know each one of these visits is a is a team of people going out there to go and inspect features along the route to check for any ecological constraints that we need to be aware of that could impact on on the HS2 project. So I mentioned there were 500,000 hours worked. I mean, I've got a construction background. I've worked on projects. I haven't done as many hours as that in a big construction project. So and this is just the ecological survey work. So um, yeah, so it's a massive, massive program. Um, and the reason we do ecological surveys is to, uh, well, a couple of reasons there that I've listed there. So we, we want to make sure that we understand what um, species are present along the route so that we can make sure that if we need to translocate them out of the way of the new railway line, so we can build new habitats for them. And also to make sure that if there is work like clearance works to be done, for example, um, cutting down trees or demolishing buildings, we need to make sure that we're doing that in a responsible way. So we need to make sure we've inspected those features, checking for any any um, protected species. So if you want to do some archaeological works, for example, you need to, you can't proceed until you've checked for any uh, potential reptiles, for example, if it's in the middle of a field. Or if you want to cut down some trees, you need to make sure you fully inspect all those trees to check for any potential presence of bats, for example. And we'll use this data to secure protected species licenses and make sure that what we're doing is responsible and, and we've got suitable mitigation in place to allow us to build the railway. Um, and we've worked with various other subcontractors um, to, to deliver these works, including Black and Reach. But just talking about some of the data challenges, because obviously this is a um, digital ecology, and I wanted to talk about some of the things that have gone well and some of the things that haven't gone so well around these ecology surveys over the last four years. So back thinking back to 2017 when I started working on this, um, we were collecting data in, in basically in spreadsheets, lots of spreadsheets. So basically we had a we had a, an Excel spreadsheet which had a, which basically had a form. So if you go out here and do a survey, you would the, the surveyors on site would fill in this form on an Excel spreadsheet on a tablet on site, and that data would get collected collected together and batched up into sort of a monthly batch. So if you went out and did 100 surveys, you'd have 100 spreadsheets that we, we would put into a zip file and the subcontractor doing those surveys will then pass them over to, to me and my team at LM. Um, and the worst information with, with our client HS2 would, would dictate that we need to then send that data to them a month in arrears of doing the survey. So if we did some surveys in March 2017, our client's expected to have that data by the end of April. 
the problem we found with using lots and lots of spreadsheets is that the subcontractor would deliver that data to us in a big file. Our team would undertake an assurance exercise on that data, and then we would then throw the whole zip file back to them. So here you go, here's your hundred spreadsheets back um, with our comments. And then they would make some changes and tweaks and you know, take an input and board our comments, and then they'd send it back to us. And the problem was that this just, it, it was a very slow and clunky process, just just having to work on it one one contract at a time. And only once you finish your, your exercise could you then pass it on to the other person. And this led to a lot of delays. And ultimately, many months later, um, slower than we should have delivered it we, uh, with, a, with an unhappy client, really, because they were getting the data too late. And that's not just HS2 Limited, who are out, who are my client, but also the end users who want to use this to produce the designs and write these protected species licenses. You know, they were clambering for this data. Um, so we knew we needed a, a new approach to, 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 to manage this data. So some of the early solutions. Uh, well, as LM, we already had a, a system for collecting data, which, which is, happened to be called FieldView. And we've used that on many of our construction projects in the past for doing inspections on site. So um, in construction, maybe in the past, we would have gone out with a sort of clipboard and pen and paper. So we replaced that with this FieldView system, which basically allows us to so basically put a questionnaire on a tablet that people can then fill in and that gets synced to a centralized database. Um, but because it was an existing platform, which we already had in-house, all we had to do was just load the survey forms onto this system and away we go. That got rid of the spreadsheet. So it sounded like we were onto a winner. So we now had our subcontractors and LM all working on the same platform. And in theory, this seemed brilliant because we'd solved the problem because on Monday, subcontractor could go out and do the survey send that data to us at the end of the day and once they sync the tablet and on Tuesday we could check it send it back with any comments on Wednesday subcontractor could address it and then on the Thursday we get it and everybody's happy so it seemed like we were onto a winner uh, the problem was that the the client still wanted the data in a spreadsheet format so the works information hadn't changed or even though we would brought in this system uh, and the problem we had is that although we'd used this system that we already had in-house, so it was very, very quick to deploy, and we felt like we were solving the problem, trying to then export that data out of Vilby back into a spreadsheet format, we, we ended up with a lot of issues doing that because the system wasn't really set up for doing that. Um, and because we deployed our own system as, as, as LM, um, we took on that risk of trying to manage that process of exporting the data out of the system, which sounds easy in principle, but we had lots of data corruption issues, lots of that sort of manually having to copy paste data out of field view back into a spreadsheet again. And in the end, we ended up losing a lot of the gains that we'd that we benefited from at the start. So we still ended up with a with an unhappy client. So I think I learned a lot from 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 mistakes we made in 2018 around risk and um, taking on that risk and if, if it's a system that you're responsible for and also bearing in mind that you've got, to, you've got to consider these sorts of things from sort of the start to end process just fixing one part of the solution you know without considering the full life cycle of where that data is going can potentially cause problems further down the line um, so we, in the end we didn't actually move as far forward as we would have liked uh, we, so we learned a lot from that um, so for the 2019 and the 2020 season we brought and brought some new survey subcontractors. We we dropped field view because of these issues exporting the data. It wasn't really set up for doing large numbers of ecological surveys. Um, it was just the easiest tool we had at the time. So we dropped that. And with our new subcontractors, we specified that they needed to come on board with a system already deployed that they could then own. If they had any good ideas or if the surveyors could have, you know, had better ways of collecting that data, they could own that delete that data collection process and, and manage that themselves and they were better placed to do that so transferring that risk onto them made a lot more sense for us um, so that allowed us to to spend less time worrying about the front end of the data and allow us to focus a bit more on the, on the back end which is where really we wanted to be working around distributing that data to the right teams on the enabling works who needed it so i've done a little process map all that looks like so um in the same year um, the client dropped the use of spreadsheets and moved to a geo database file delivery format so we were able to respond to that or our subcontractors were um, they've delivered um, geo database files into our new data hub uh, which is where we now do our assurance similar to the to what we used to do with field view working in a in a single system um, but without so much of the risk of having to export data back into spreadsheets because that had gone away now um, and having all the data integrated in one place meant we could deliver data to our uh, contractors on site who were doing clearance works. 
and we could also share that with our web platform and our GIS system to allow our licensing teams writing these protected species licenses to access the data um, real time as it landed from our supply chain and ultimately then to deliver that data to our clients and also to all the contractors who are working on, on the HS2 project. Uh, just in terms of moving on from that, so um, we've got a 25,000 surveys. We've got, we've got a load of data now on um, on the the ecology of the West Midlands and along this HS2 corridor. So we've got so, so much data. And we're looking now at how we can use that to, um, it, looking at, for example, with the back data and using using automated processes to analyze that and map back flight lane, flying. So, the surveyors have been out there, they've done the surveys, they've identified lots and lots of bats commuting across the route. Um, and we, we're now able to automate that and, and look at the bat flight lines based on those observations, um, rather than having to go out there looking for the for the bat flight lines sort of visibly, which is how we used to do it in the past. So that's a really exciting um, prospect for the future. That's everything I'm gonna say about our experiences on page two. I'm gonna hand you back over to Matt now. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Stephen. Really interesting. Really, really good. And thanks for uh, encapsulating all that so uh, so well. Um, right. So if I can get the system to move me on. So I, I, I just thought I'd give you a brief overview of the BV on-site system that we've been using on this project with um, Stephen's team. Um, work the technology so the system uh, uses tried and tested uh, software components from um, Microsoft and Esri which have been integrated into a single workflow which is depicted here um, using BV code which connects their things together and that's been done by our digital products and services group it's a cloud-based system meaning it can be used anywhere with access to Wi-Fi or 4G and the system itself provides surveyors with details of their surveys and their survey performance through GPS enabled 4G tablets or, or actually their phones. Critically, as Stephen was alluding to, it, it provides complete control over the process between data capture and end reporting for us to provide data to, to LM and HS2. And it does that with it in, in a common data environment. No more Excel spreadsheets. And from the recording, uh, and it covers the recording of um, surveyor observations within the system, sketches, images, bioacoustic sound files, through the assurance of the data itself and the, the checkers and reviewers who do that from the BV perspective, and then reporting out through the geo database and the schemas that have been set as a, as a format for reporting. And it's really helped us to minimize the data transfer risks and turn around assured data in the formats required um, pretty much for, for this scheme and for the scale of the projects in, in what I'd say is a record time. Oh, reporting and progress reporting is another key aspect to it. It's a modular system and we can bring out progress reporting at each stage so we can check when surveyors have been to sites and what they found, where each survey is within the assurance process, if there are any issues with it. And we can quickly access prior survey data as well to provide context for new surveys which may be being undertaken in the same location or the same area. It's enabled us to manage a direct pool and, and direct a pool of over 150 surveyors this year to locations of over 5,000 protected species surveys and monitor their location in real time. So importantly, it integrates health and safety requirements, enabling near live hazard feedback and the actions and management actions we can take to avoid the hazards. And the outcome has been that we've had one lightly twisted ankle in over 85,000 hours of project work this year. I have to say that the system has been invaluable as well during the COVID pandemic, helping not only with logistics, but also streaming, streamlining communication between the office and field-based team. It's really been a step change, and this is the most surveys I think that, that we've ever delivered in one season. And I think um, from, uh, from an LM perspective, this is this year they've delivered the most surveys out of the 25,000 that Stephen mentioned. So, if on-site presents the current state of the art in digital technology, or part of it, what of the future? Well, I'd like to fo turn a focus back onto the higher level concept that we started to talk about, about how digital ecology can help us enable a more embedded natural asset management approach.
Back in 2018, BV delivered a landscape master plan for 630 hectares of degraded floodplain along the River Trent at Burton. The scheme incorporated landscape, landscape scale design, natural capital accounting and ecosystem services valuation. It's drawn in over £2 million worth of funding since then. The project was able to show that biodiversity improvement it brings will provide significant benefits to local communities in areas of high environmental deprivation. However, recent feedback from industry and natural capital investment forums indicates that a lack of data and understanding of such benefits is limiting the supply of these projects at the scale needed to arrest biodiversity decline. And once implemented, these schemes really require regular, regular and efficient monitoring to verify the outcomes of large scale projects, particularly for investors who need the proof that their investment is paying off. But what if we took a natural asset management approach to this issue? The recently published natural, National Infrastructure Strategy calls for the creation of a national digital twin. If digital twins for infrastructure and utility assets can allow better decision making by providing a digital representation of the way those systems function and respond to change, can we create biodiversity or natural asset digital twins for our UK landscapes? Could this kickstart the development of more biodiversity projects of scale and perhaps allow us to make mo the most out of net gain by developing strategic schemes that provide most value to our communities? If so, this is likely to require the clever synthesis of environmental data at scale and technology that enables monitoring to do this efficiently, which is something our next speaker is going to be able to provide um, a great insight on. So Simon, over to you. Great, thanks for the introduction um, there, Matt, and uh, thanks everyone for, for joining the webinar today. So, if I can just take control. Okay, there we go. So just very briefly to introduce us, who are Resitech? Um, those of you who haven't come across us, we're quite a small company um, based here in the UK. Um, we work with primarily satellite imagery, um, though we draw in a lot of different types of information. And picking up on the themes that Matt's been talking about, um, we're really sort of looking at, you know, mapping at scale. You know, how can you move beyond um, you know, these sort of small localized independent surveys to start to be producing, you know, the, the sorts of information um, that give you, you know, insights to, to what's there in the physical environment, helping you manage your assets and infrastructure, um, you know, across larger areas. A um, little bit of an overview here on the introductory slide of, of sort of how we operate. Um, as I said, it's, it's primarily satellite imagery we work with. We're always looking to draw in um, open source information. There's an incredible amount of data out there today um, without necessarily needing to undertake huge costs of acquisition. Um, we focus on um, AI-based approaches, machine learning, pattern recognition, and to drive a lot of our mapping. Um, while it's mapping that we are primarily providing to our customers, um, that's not the only way that they need data. Um, you've seen a lot of different examples of reports and dashboards and tables. Um, and so we're flexible in terms of how we can present that information back. And ultimately, you know, everything, you know, has to be online these days. So, um, you know, bringing that back to people in a secure online portal um, that you'll see a few examples of today. Quick overview at the bottom there of the sort of key sectors that we work in. Um, but really, of course, here today, we're thinking about, you know, how does this sit within that digital ecology framework um, that Matt has just summarized. So I'm going to talk us through really focused on three different case studies. We're only going to be able to touch on these very briefly um, as time allows, but hopefully we'll give you a, a flavor of what Resitec does and, and how we do what we do. Um, so first one, we took a habitat class. Um, so, you know, looking at mapping land cover, establishing a baseline of what's there, um, looking at change detection, changes in the landscape over time. And um, once we have, of course, the understanding of what habitats are there, and starting to look at condition, you know, understanding um, where there may be um, degradation of habitats, health concerns, and we'll look at that through, a, through an example of woodland health monitoring here in the UK. And finally, um, bringing that together with, you know, habitat connectivity. So thinking about, you know, once you understand um, where the landscapes are, um, you know, what condition they're in, 
how do they interact with um, with the surroundings and with the people that are using them and their access accessibility um, and uh, you know how can we you know get more benefit from them in the future what you're going to see as we step through the the three examples um, is that we're in all cases we're going to be looking at you know starting really from a sort of local example you know almost the sort of way things are done today where there's existing information there's existing ground survey which has has told us what's there it's told us what habitats are there it's told us where the where the bats live um, but really the focus for us and and, and where we position ourselves as a business is, is is scaling that up so scaling that up to to mapping at a regional level um, and scaling that up ultimately to, to mapping at a, at a national level uh, and you'll see some examples of that again today and, it, and it's not just about having you know a good baseline um, of what's there though certainly all of the examples um, will touch on you know just mapping what is the current condition what is the current you know baseline you know habitat habitat condition and presence of habitats in different areas um, but also thinking about you know, how can we monitor that um, not just actively um, going forward but also look back retrospectively um, with you know archives of satellite imagery um, we can see you know what conditions were, were present in the past you know how habitat locations have changed um, and use that as part of a plan to sort of guide future decision making so let's jump straight into some examples. Um, and uh, I'll start off with an example of, of land cover and change detection mapping. Um, this, this particular example, we're working for a water utility um, catchment resource manager. They were very specifically focused on understanding what crop types um, they had within their catchment. Uh, and that was really to engage with you know, farmer stakeholders on their management practices so that they could be you know, seeking to control um, water quality issues um you know passage of pesticides fertilizer etc into into surface water our approach um taking an open source time series of satellite data so when i say open source i mean the data is freely available um it's something that's available not just uk wide but but globally um, so it's very easy to draw down on and of course keeps the, the cost of this type of mapping um you know relatively low um, we started with a you know known locations of where there have been specific crop types for a particular year used our machine learning model to identify where those crops were found uh, and ultimately provided that back to our customer um, online and also mobile access. They could be starting to interact with the farmers, landowners when they're out in the field. Uh, and the ultimate outcome here is that, you know, the, the machine learning model could learn the seasonal patterns of those different crops uh, and repeat that mapping across multiple years. So really this sort of concept of, you know, investigating it, investing in survey data once uh, and then being able to use it, you know, repeatedly um, to map other locations and also to map at other points in time. So very quickly, um, you know, it's quite simple. What you'll see is the output here. It's a really sort of, you know, basic sort of baseline mapping. And of course, we're just talking about crop types here. We're not talking about the other types of, of habitat in the area, um, though of course we, we can map those as well. But here we go, 2017, you can see some of the, the key crops, you know, winter wheat, maize, a lot of pasture in this area. And then as we step forward in um, 2018, um, as you'd expect, you see that, you know, broadly the pasture stays the same, um, but the arable crops, you know, switch field to field um, on, a, on a rotation. Um, you know, an example of how another customer is using the same information here, um, you'll, see, you'll see in the middle of that image down in the bottom, there's a, a large solar farm um, that wasn't there in 2017. It's been, it's been built since. Um, so one customer is using this information to say, okay, what is the what is the comparative value of different agricultural land? What is being what is it being used for today? What has it been used for historically? And then using that to make investment decisions about you know where they seek to acquire land and what price they seek to put on it. So we go, a nice quick example um, of you know being able to map what the sort of what's on the ground, what the habitat classes are, what the land cover you know is within a particular area of interest. And that's something that is you know, scalable across the UK uh, and of course we've applied around the world as well. But let's, let's take it to the sort of next stage and, and start thinking about you know, habitat condition. You know, how can we actually start to understand you know, from this sort of remote monitoring, um, you know, what, is, what is actually there um, on the ground and make judgments about you know, where investment might be needed to you know, mitigate um, degradation or perhaps take, you know, more severe management actions um, to minimize a problem going forward. Um, 
we're looking at woodlands here. Um, you know, we could be looking at other types of habitat, but woodland is certainly an area that, that we looked at quite extensively, um, both in the context of, of government agencies, but also commercial companies, you know, managing their, their timber resource. The particular example we're going to look at here is, is based on um, ash dieback within the UK. I'm sure many of you are familiar um, with that issue, um, which has been in the UK for the, for the best part of 10 years now. And, and uh, you know, gradually, you know, spreading and becoming more severe. Um, you know, thousands of trees every year that are having to be removed. Um, you know, to prevent um, you know, both safety issues and also how to you know limit the further spread um, of the of the disease. So our approach here, um, you might get bored of me saying this, but again, it's to to drill down on that same you know open source time series. Um, time series being the really key point here because you know even throughout the year. And of course, you see the tree canopy change. You see changes in vegetation. Um, so having access not to just a, a single point in time, but to imagery that's been captured, you know, once a week, um, you know, over an entire year, um, really starts to give you, you know, ability to see, you know, in-depth insights as to how things are changing. Um, we again had known locations from existing survey where we could actually begin to understand how does that tree canopy change, um, and then develop a what's a pattern recognition model to identify affected trees uh, and scale that up um, to be um, applicable um, nationwide. And that was the really key thing here, um, you know, and I touched on it on, on the introduction slide, is that, you know, it's the ability to sort of scale some of these things um, to the scale of some of the infrastructure projects um, that we're now talking about, you know, two entire catchments to something of the scale of HS2, um, that's really drawing on information you already have, um, and you know this, this satellite information and other sources that are out there and accessible in the in the public domain. So again, let's see a little bit of, of what that looks like. So here we have an example. Um, this is actually part of Gloucestershire. Um, the uh, the mapping is actually available, you know, England wide um, currently. So you'll see there this um, you know red, orange, and yellow, um, which is indicating the severity um, of the um, ash dieback. And then, you know, summarised at woodland block level, taken from the National Forest Estate, and what is the proportion of that area that has been been affected? Um, so, you know, it's something when we start to be used to, you know, trace the the spread, um, understand where the most severe impacts are, and then make decisions about, um, you know, how to to manage um, that process within within different woodland blocks. Not sure how well these will show up on the on the webinar screen, but a couple of examples um, taken um, from visiting those locations in the field. So, uh, first of all, the the red frame on the right hand side. Um, so, you know, ash dieback is really characterised. Something that happens over several years. Um, the uh, the canopy um, starts to discolour. Um, and eventually you're left with, with no canopy at all. Um, so you can see obviously tree in the foreground and, and some of the background there where there's you know, much less canopy compared to um, the other species of trees um, in the surroundings. Uh, and then on the right, oh, sorry, on the left uh, with the yellow outline, um, that entire ridge in the background, which should be you know, a, a vibrant green um, at that time of year um, is you know, very brown, um, you know, big gaps again, um, due to you know dead and and, and dying ash trees um, across that across that slope, so um, something that you know very, you know very successful in its application, um, something that's equally applicable to other types of you know pest and disease that affect not just just trees but other habitats as well, uh, and because of that data availability and um, can be scaled to to large areas in in one go. Final example I will run through quickly. Um, starting to look at a bit more, you know, in terms of how does how does uh, how do these you know mapped areas interact with their environment, and how can we drill down on on some of this information? And, and just a pretty sort of unique example of, of some of the things that you can do with with satellite data. Um, so this was sort of targeted at, at town planners, government agencies, um, who were you know looking to understand within the urban environment um, what was the impact of the, the distribution of green space. And in particular, in this instance, the relationship of that to, to urban heat, heat island. You know, how, how was that impacting heating in the urban environment? And ultimately, you know, how could they use that information to see where there might be, you know, excessive heating um, that might be affecting, you know, vulnerable populations 
uh, and use that to guide future decision making on investment in, in putting in new green space. So no great surprise here, in terms of our approach, we're, we're drilling down that same open source time series of satellite data, um, building in this case an urban training data set to differentiate tree and grass cover, um, and then drawing on another satellite that, that lets us look at land surface temperatures and focused on a really peak summer day where we'd expect to see some of the highest temperatures you know, in the year. Um, and bringing that together, and I won't show you the details of this, but bringing that together within our, our platform um, to interact with, you know, population demographics uh, and see, you know, where that, where the greatest impact to, to vulnerable populations was. So, you know, the, the key piece here was about really combining those multiple sources of data, uh, not just about, you know, mapping a baseline or understanding monitoring, but bringing all that information together in one place um, to, to aid decision making about, you know, what to do, what to do next in those, in those urban environments. I think we have our, uh, you know, green space map. This is part of Manchester um, in the UK. So, you know, tree cover in dark green, um, you know, grass cover in light green. And um, you can see a few golf courses there in the, in the bottom left. Obviously, so you can see some larger patches of woodland um, along the river. But you can also see the sort of, the sort of residential neighbourhoods that have, you know, more tree cover. Um, compared to, to some of these over here on the left where there's there's very little tree cover um, <clears throat> and you'll see that very definitely does have an impact um, as we step forward and look at the land surface um, you'll see you know it doesn't take a, a genius really there to, to pick out um, we've got you know blue areas much lower temperatures in those large woodland areas um, and areas where there was you know no tree cover no green space um, is where you tend to get some of the, the highest temperatures. And that's quite a range, you know, 20 degrees at the top of the tree canopy um, in those woodlands and through to 35 degrees C, um, you know, at the roads in some of those, you know, dense, you know, urban only um, areas. Um, elsewhere in the city. Now, if we put those two together, then of course you really start to see that it, it's really driven by that, you know, proximity to green space. Um, and when you start to look at, you know, who is living in some of these areas, and then it really starts to target, you know, who has the potential to be affected by, you know, heat related illnesses. And, and you know, that can be a guiding factor in, in putting in future green space in the future. So hopefully that's given you all a little bit of an insight into, um, you know, what Resitech um, does as an organisation, um, you know, working with the likes of, of Black and Beach and others. Um, we're really striving to make sure that, you know, when you make some of these big investments in the volumes of, of data that Stephen talked about, um, that there, there is a, a, a use for those beyond the, you know, immediate requirements, um, and they can be used to, to scale up to some of the, the regional, national mapping um, that really support, you know, baseline and monitoring um, for digital ecology. So thank you, Tom, and I will pass back to Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. So moving on to the wrap up. I think what Simon showed is really a you know, really great demonstration of the power of AI and remote sensing and it shows the great functionality that this technology has now, um, but also shows what potential future use it could support for data requirements at landscape scale, digital, natural digital twins or uh, landscape scale investigations that we were talking about earlier. So I'd just like to just wrap up by exploring that a little bit further. Um, you know, what, what Simon demonstrated was the use of remote sensing coupled with AI can provide the main data around habitat type and condition at scale. And we're talking, you know, regional, national level scale. And for, for I mean, it's really cost effective. But combining this with, say, environmental economics expertise, we can also use that to set baseline accounts for landscape scale natural capital. And we can identify opportunities and the scale of benefits that they can provide and clearly demonstrate the value of these projects to stakeholders and showing them these kind of maps is really useful and powerful in visualizing that as well as developing you know more robust case business cases for investors in natural capital and i think the really exciting aspect of, uh, of this is its application for monitoring access to open source satellite data that's updated as frequently as every seven days coupled with machine learning means we can monitor these shifts and changes in our habitats and landscapes as well as being able to chart the progress of the projects we, we want to implement and achieving the objectives that we want to do. But I think this only covers one area of its potential. 
So when we start to think about coupling that data with digital biodiversity data collected from systems like OnSite or through passive networks of sensors um, like bio bioacoustics that we see, we can start to make the linkages between the causes and effects of environmental issues, which we see are all too prevalent in our landscapes and catchments. And this greater insight can give us a better understanding of how ecosystems and infrastructure interact at a much wider scale and perhaps helps us develop more holistic and cheaper solutions, nature solutions to some of the problems we face now. Additionally, we can start to use the increasing amounts of data collected, as Simon and Stephen have both alluded to, um, at, on projects like HS2 to, to focus on things like Stephen was focusing on bat lines, but you know, perhaps um, combining the tree data with potential roost areas for bats can be trained the AI to show us those areas of high potential without having to send armies of surveyors out. But again, data collected in this kind of professional sense is limited by its focus on the reasons of why we're collecting it for, you know, for impact assessments and for protected species licensing, etc. So perhaps the final piece of the jigsaw is in realizing the value and power of data collected by a wider community through the growing number of apps that are collecting information about our environment and ecosystems on a day-by-day -day basis. So apps like PlantNet and iNaturalist and Seek. And if we can integrate the data from these sources as well, we can add an extra layer of context and understanding and strengthen the evidence base for future decision making. Conversely, using the, those sorts of apps, we can feed this information back and we can better inform our stakeholders and communities. So it opens up possibilities for education and inclusion in the projects we develop, the states, the estates and the utilities that we manage and the wider plans that we, we look to make in the future. And so perhaps by doing so, we open new routes for community investment, and new opportunities for funding and creating additional social value. I don't see this approach as being exclusive to infrastructure and it could provide the basis for managing other activities in our landscapes like farming, estate management, nature conservation and just basic wider placemaking. So with those thoughts, I'd like to draw our presentation session to a close and seek your questions on this topic. Um, so before we open the floor to questions, um, I'll just do another quick poll, give you a chance to think about the questions you may have, hopefully, and, um, and we'll take it from there. So Steve King, I think we'll, uh, if you can take the mantle of um, <laughs> being question master, not ringmaster. Yes, Matt, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you can see me again. I've put my camera back on, but it seems to have um, not be telling me that I'm there, but nevertheless, here I am. So first of all, extend our thanks to Stephen, Simon and Matt for a most enlightening presentation, uh, sparked a few ideas, questions, concerns, worries, I'm sure, and we're getting some questions coming into the uh, into the chat room now. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to try and amalgamate this one, which is a question about cost and benefit. I think it's uh, something that um, a lot of people on the call will be interested in. I think I'm going to throw this open to all three and I'm going to start with Stephen. Uh, uh, and it's a question, well, I've put several together here. Question about where is the where is the cost in all this? Because obviously there's a cost in doing this work. And and how do we, what are, have been the benefits coming out of the other end? So if I could, Stephen, if I could ask you in terms of a cost scenario uh, in, in your work on HS2, um, those two elements, the, where was the cost, when did it happen and what did you see as the benefits? Uh, Simon, perhaps if you could open that a bit wider to what you've seen in larger context and a map for anything in terms of projects we've seen for HS2 where people have had to invest the money and the outcoming benefits, did they outweigh, didn't they? I, I guess that's what I'm trying to put together here. So Stephen, if you could say something about that, answer that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So for the ecology surveys we've done on HS2, I, it, it seems to me from, from my experience around about a 50-50 split between the cost of physically doing the survey 
would be 50% of the cost typically is what we found. Um, so sending people out to go out and look for bats in the dark or taking samples of water from ponds and whatever it is we have to do out on site. Um, and, and there's a lot of the other 50% being around the, the scheduling of the surveys. So I didn't really touch on it on, on my slides, but there's a huge amount of effort that needs to go with the upfront stage to take into consideration the land um, use of the site, you know, whether it's it's land that's in it's part of the H2 route, whether it's in sort of possession or, or whether it's not. Um, so we need to take into consideration the community aspects from, from that perspective uh, and also the data processing at the back end. So that so the, the upfront stuff and and, and the, the data processing part of the, at the back end um, is sort of comparable to the cost of actually doing the survey itself. Um, don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Simon? Cost of yes, I think, I think the, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of cost aspect, you know, for us, you know, obviously I talked a lot about the sort of scaling up um, potential um, and being able to sort of scale up is really about, um, you know, you, you need a, a sort of data to, to build that mapping from. And of course, our focus, as I touched on quite a few times, is, is about, you know, doing that from, you know, effectively, you know, free data, um, you know, open source information that's regularly updated, lets you get that really regular, you know, monitoring insight um, and avoid some of the, you know, high costs associated with, you know, airborne, you know, drone type platforms that are still, you know, just very challenging to scale at the sort of things we're talking about. Um, you know, in terms of benefits, you know, it's really about, you know, by developing that mapping, you know, up front, it's then really enabling you to target, you know, subsequent field activities. We're not talking about eliminating, you know, habitat, you know, survey altogether, but it's about, you know, targeting, well, where have we got variations and where have we got different habitats first up, but then where have we got variations in condition? And therefore, you know, where do we want to go and validate? So we're capturing those different conditions and understanding, you know, what is driving those that perhaps otherwise would have been a sort of fairly randomly selected sample. Um, so that, that's probably the two key things that, that we would see. Um, you know, it's about scaling um, and then it's about targeting um, what you, where you follow up. Thanks, Simon. Matt, what's the yeah, benefits? Yeah, just, just uh, I suppose, just, just quickly, I suppose the, um, in terms of the, the on-site system and, and the use of that on HS2, I think one of the, the key areas has been, you know, access is, uh, is, is, is an issue, particularly this year with COVID. Um, and not all of the sites that we've been um, to are doing, doing surveys are necessarily in full control of um, HS2 or LM. And whether they're private, then there's been a lot of concern about you know, health and safety in relation to that. Um, what the system has allowed us to do is actually um, reallocate surveys very quickly when access hasn't been able to be provided or has been pulled at the, at the last minute. Um, and I, I know that's more of an issue perhaps for, for upfront HS2 project development as well. So, so, so that has been one real benefit because we haven't had people standing around not being able to do the surveys that they were um, programmed or scheduled to do because of access issues. Um, mm. And I just just to reiterate Simon uh, Simon's point as well for the remote sensing, if if you use the right way, we can actually cover uh, a greater area uh, and use that focused with on-site data collection in a much more st strategic way to actually reduce the costs. I think overall of surveys in the future, um, you know, the, the develop the, the use of this for phase one habitat surveys for uh, underpinning the, the habitat classes for net gain. Um, you know, I, I think could have a real impact and change on the way that that's done um, for for organised for project developers and for regulators as well. Um, so that would be mm. those would be my takeaways. Thanks, Matt. Um, got one here about data security, um, backup, retention of data. Um, obviously going to be handling a lot of information often from sites and Simon some of the things you've mentioned there that's you know it is big it's a big data environment so the question really is um, uh, keeping that data secure keeping it for seven eight twelve years I suppose some some clients want it kept and backing up um, what's the what's the way of doing that what's the challenge what's the way of making sure the data's secure for a given client or uh, 
organization and and backing up and retaining it um i suppose it's a storage question as much as anything simon can i start with you sure yes yeah. so, um i mean look, it, it's obviously um you know everyone's heard of, of gdpr as, as obviously a key a key driver on on data um certainly some of the concerns we hear um from customers are about you know making sure there's a clear understanding of exactly where data is stored um you know where are those servers located you know are they you know in the uk are they overseas uh, and of course what you know what protocols and processes do do we have as a business um you know around those so um you know obviously any customer that has those queries it's a case of having you know a clear you know documented protocol that we can provide to them to give them that assurance and to be able to provide you know the necessary you know methods of, of access and authentication and to give them comfort that, that only they um, have the necessary access to their data um, for us personally we're you know we are a UK based business we do work around the world but you know we we maintain all the data that we have you know in the UK if we were to be asked by a US customer that we had to keep the data there um, you know that would be something that we would we would always look into um, you know on their behalf so it, it's always a concern uh, it's one of the number one things that we'll deal with with customers um, and and it's just a case of, of being aware of you know what the requirements are um, and being flexible to adapt to, to how different companies operate mm, yeah um, Matt, from from a Black and Veatch perspective, if we're handling a lot of data for a client, how do we keep it secure? Where do we store it? How do we retain it? What's the safety? Um, well, all of the um, all of the systems have gone through a really rigorous check um, to ensure that they meet GDPR and that they're on secure servers um, in line with HS2 uh, requirements. So it, that's been a big part of the design of the system. They're on secure mm. cloud-based servers with with Microsoft, you know, one of the the, larger, the, the largest tech organisations uh, in the world. So we we are pretty um, sure that that that, that data is concerned is uh, secure, and, and we've met all the requirements for that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, we've got about a minute to go now, um, and I think better leave a few of the questions out now and, and look at the poll results matt are you um you able to yeah so so, so really really interesting to start uh, uh, and part of the reason for put, putting these questions up was to see how things might change i suppose through the the, the webinar but uh, you know a really interesting kind of um, mm. range of results there availability biodiversity data not not an issue i think um seem to be but the public understanding and support and investment and funding and key key aspects, which are part, perhaps the greatest challenge to, that we face in this, the, the, uh, with, with the dilemma we posed at the start. Um, so really interesting. But it, if we move on to the next poll, again, that's that's quite interesting in the way that um, that shows that you know how data mm -hmm. access to real time data and ecosystem services data. You know that people think that that's um that that's a real enabler so so really really interesting interesting outcomes um and perhaps citizen sensing isn't but i don't know i think there's something there i think there is a that's a really good way of engaging in in increasing public education and awareness of of some of the issues in this area interesting indeed well uh, we'll wrap up there because it's five o'clock or just slightly after so uh just like to say again a big thank you to our presenters stephen simon and matt um and thank you all for attending today um thank you very much indeed please do reach out to the presenters if you've got any um questions or queries and raise them in the survey that follows please um i hope you can join us for our next webinar which is in december but until then on behalf of black and beach and our presenters Thanks for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye everyone.